Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, wherever you're at. Uh, welcome to today's uh, presentation on Elevate Your Revit Projects with ID8 Software. As always, it is a pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, my name is Sash Kazminijad, and I am the Customer Success Manager with ID8 Software. Uh, I'm located in Portland, Oregon. My background's in architecture, and I'm a California licensed architect as well. Been with ID8 now for over seven years. Um, the main focus has been on the uh, Revit platform and a little other product as well. So why are we here today? Well, we're here to help you simplify your Revit data challenges. So ID8 software offers five products currently, and they're all focused around Revit. So we have Bimlink, Explore, Sticky, Apps, and Style Manager. And really, we're all about data editing and data management. This is our area of expertise. We've been doing this for many years, and our products are really focused around helping you manage your Revit model data. The other thing I would really want to mention to everybody here is uh, our support and reputation. Uh, we have a lot of great information on our website. So not only about our products, but we have a lot of educational information, whether it be blog posts or uh, videos on particular products or workflows. Also, our live classes such as this one. Uh, so be sure to check out our website for that information. We also have our technical support side of things. Everybody on the ID8 software team uh, helps to deliver on support. So for example, myself and Richard, uh, even our director of software development, all take part in technical support. So if you have any questions, whether it be workflow related or perhaps you're having an issue, you know, let us know, we're here to help you out. All of our products have built-in getting started guides. So if you do launch a product and you're not quite sure where to start, definitely take a look at the help uh, topics uh, within each product, and they will be a great reference to help you get started. Now, in terms of supporting and updating our software, we follow the Autodesk development cycle, meaning we will develop or make any sort of improvements to the current version of Revit plus the three prior versions of Revit as well. So for example, if there's a new feature we can add uh, and it pertains to Revit 2021, but is also available in let's say 2019 and 2018, we'll also add that as well. We do have archives of our older versions of our software as well on our website, but we don't make any updates um, or new improvements to those uh, pieces of software. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and start with ID8 BIMLINK, and we'll kind of go through each product here and some demonstrations of each one. So ID8 BIMLINK is all about taking your Revit model data out to Microsoft Excel, where you can view that data and edit that data, and then bring that information back into your Revit model to make updates. The reason why we've picked uh, Excel as the medium for uh, editing is because Excel's been around forever. It has superior editing tools. You can do copy paste, fill down, you can concatenate data, you could do a fine replace, translate to other languages and so forth. In addition to that, uh, we also have a lot of access to a lot of Revit model data and you can kind of see in the, the green uh, square over here, we have access to all this data that can help you make informed decisions on what you want to edit. Uh, in addition to that, uh, BIMLINK uh, helps you also create new sheets and rooms and spaces and areas. You can also create key schedule information or uh, revision sequence information if you need to. You can also create new content uh, from information that has been placed in your model. So for example, if you place some masses or generic models, you can actually create new types as well. And then also here you can see we have some newer uh, items that uh, we're now allowed to create within uh, uh, Excel and BIMLINK. So for example, if you need to generate new levels, we can help you do that. We can also create new types for existing families that have been loaded up in your project. We can also create new views. And again, more sheets and furniture and furniture systems and so forth. So BIMLINK has a lot of power. It's not just about editing data and bringing it back in. We can also create new content as well. And as I mentioned before in one of the slides, uh, we ship BIMLINK with a lot of pre-configured links. So the nice thing is if you say, okay, I wanna edit something in my Revit model, but I'm not quite sure where to start, use one of our links. You can customize these links, add or remove parameters as you see fit, and then you can uh, bring that information back into your model once you make the edits. So let's go ahead and just take a look at some demonstrations here on how BIMLINK can help you with your uh, Revit models. All right, so for this first example here, I'm gonna use a mechanical model. 
And one of the nice things about uh, uh, all of our products is we encompass all disciplines. So it's not just about, let's say, the architectural discipline. Our products will cover all disciplines. So if you're architectural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural, uh, on the construction side of things, or even like facilities, we got you covered. So real quickly, uh, before I get into the BinLink demo, I just want to point out that all of our software can be found under the ID8 software tab. And if you have all of our products or are interested in all of our products, uh, here's what your uh, current ribbon will look like. So we've kind of broken it up into two parts. Uh, we kind of have our core uh, products here, which I like to say are big uh, data editing and data management tasks. And then we have the ID8 apps, which is actually one program, but it, it's actually made up of nine uh, separate uh, applications. And I'm gonna talk about ID8 apps here um, in a little bit. So let's start with BIMLink and just kind of get a general idea of how this program works. And again, I won't be able to demo every single little feature of every product today, but I wanna give you a good understanding of how everything works. And as I mentioned before, be sure to check out those handouts because I did provide links uh, to each product on our website so you can get some more information. And of course, you can always reach out to us if you have further questions. Okay, so I have BIMLink uh, launched over here. And if you have no links in here, I'm gonna explain these here in just a moment, um, you get a different page uh, right here. And it basically is a kind of getting started page. And that getting, uh, getting started page will give you some tips on how to get started. Once you actually have some links loaded up over here, then the uh, page changes. One of the great things about this page, uh, especially for those that are, uh, that are on the line today that are BIM managers, uh, is that you can customize this page to have links to your content at your office. Um, and so I've actually had some fun uh, playing around with this uh, link over here and really customizing it to meet my needs. Uh, so this is what's great about you know, a product like BIMLink. Okay, so one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start by clicking on the new button. So I wanna create a new link, okay? And let me just explain to you real quickly how this interface works. Um, here, when I hit the browse button, uh, are kind of uh, subfolders here that break out our links kind of on a, a per discipline basis, whether you're architectural or construction or on the MEP side of things. Then we've also broken them out by certain workflows. So for those of you here that are doing Kobe, we have you covered with Kobe, uh, and these Kobe links are designed to work with the um, uh, BIM operability tools that you can uh, download and install into Revit. So they work hand in hand with them. Uh, also, you can create new elements. As I mentioned before, we can create new levels, we can create new views, new areas, uh, et cetera. Uh, we also have our whole help check. So if you wanna find dimensions that have been overridden, uh, or if you wanna look at keynote tags or the model line usage, that's what this is all about. Um, so one of the things I always like to tell people to do when you're new to BIMLink is you know, click at the top level over here for samples, and then just put a check mark uh, for here that says include files and subfolders. And here's just a good idea as the cap to the capability of BIMLink. Um, and so, and one of the things I wanna point out is no matter what, if you click on any one of these, we'll give you a description as to what this link is designed to do. Um, and so like, you know, here for assemblies, list all assemblies in the projects, right? Or ceilings or whatever it may be, we give you uh, information uh, right there. You can also sort it by category um, as well. So for example, if you are interested in modifying data related to, let's say mechanical uh, equipment, you can have uh, use our defined libraries here, which are our links uh, that we've already uh, predefined or by using one of your Revit schedules as well. So this is a little bit more category specific and, uh, and specific to uh, you know, how our links are, are composed or by your schedules. And then you can also use one of your schedules. And what's great about this is we don't list every schedule in your project. We list it, you know, actually we do list every schedule here because we don't have a category yet. Over here, we filter just by the particular uh, type of schedule. So I'm gonna go to browse here to um, start with. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna look at uh, a renaming exercise. So I'm gonna just type in the word rename to see what we have put together for predefined links. And one of the ones I want to point out here is this one called Project Standards Rename Types. And here it tells you you can rename all the family names and type names uh, within a project or seed file. And then right here, we break it out by instance or type-based link, meaning this is the core data that we're interested in editing. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you uh, about BIMLink is whether you do instance or type-based links, in a lot of situations, you can actually show both instance and type parameters 
in one kind of spreadsheet, but depending on what you pick over here, only one type of category will be editable, whether they're type parameters or instance. The other ones become kind of read only. And we do this on purpose so that you don't accidentally make mistakes um, uh, and go in circles when editing your data. It's really kind of a fail safe uh, protection here. So let's take a look at this one here real quickly. Now this particular link over here happens to be a multi-category link, meaning we are showing a multi-category. And our multi-category in BIMLink is far larger and more in-depth than the built-in Revit uh, multi-category. So that's the power of programming is we have the ability to access more data and present you with more data. Uh, so that's really one of the great things um, uh, about this uh, ability, right? Um, so that's just something I want to point out here. And if I show full preview of these 166 uh, elements, and there's not that many families in here, we could see we're filtering uh, all the data where the type name is editable. There are situations in which the type name uh, is not editable, therefore um, uh, there's no point in trying to rename it if you can't. So we just say only show us the ones that are um, editable. And then we're sorting everything categorically from air terminals all the way down to whatever the last category may be, which I believe is Windows in Revit. And then here is where you can add or remove parameters. You can filter parameter data if you want to by you know, using um, any of the display filters here. It's really up to you. We kept this link very simple over here by just listing the family name, type name, and the type mark. I also wanna point out that everything in white is editable and everything in like this gray hatch means this particular parameter does not apply to this particular family. And then everything in gray is read only or does not meet the criteria of this particular link. In this example here, category air terminals is not allowed to be uh, changed. You can't change the category of a family here. Um, so that's the basics of, you know, getting access to the data. Uh, I'm going to hit done here because even though I, I picked a project standard rename types, you don't just have to use that link just to rename um, uh, information. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and look at uh, mechanical. Uh, and so here's another link that we made here, mechanical types, where I can man you know, manage the information here. And it's a type-based link for mechanical equipment types. And if I go to next over here, you see that I'm also listing the family name and type name, but a few more parameters here, but it only pertains to mechanical equipment types. This allows me to really just focus on this one category. I could have certainly edited that other link only to show certain categories, but I figured this one's pretty easy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave this information um, you know, as is. Uh, and again, I could add or remove parameters, but what I'm gonna do here is, um, actually, let's just go ahead and add one more. Why not just add comments? or type comments, why not? So I'm gonna just uh, do a filter here for type and I'll add the type comments here. And you see that's editable. Let's hit done. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna export this uh, information out. And let's just export this to here. And I'm gonna save this out. And then I'm gonna open this Excel file and edit it. So I'm gonna show you how easy it is to uh, uh, edit this information. So for the type mark over here, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call this uh, ME-1 for mechanical equipment one. And then I'm just gonna fill this down. And because Excel recognizes the, um, the plus one over here, it automatically just goes ME-1 to ME-19. And then for the manufacturer, uh, I'm just gonna make up a, a company over here. I'm gonna call this um, MECHCO for mechanical company, whatever that manufacturer may be. And then all I need to do here is fill this down as well. And then the model, I don't have the model information over here, but maybe what I'll do is I'll put a note in here to enter model info. So maybe as we get more information in our specifications, then maybe what I could do is uh, fill this out so when it shows up in the schedule, people know that they need to edit the model information, okay? And then for the type comments, you know, I could say anything I want over here, right? air handler unit, just as an example. So you get the, uh, you know, you get the idea here, right? Air box, and we have a couple of air boxes over here. So I can kind of fill in this information as well. So while I even said I'm interested in editing the family name and type name, I also edited some other bits of information over here. And then finally, what I do want to do is edit the family name. And what I'm going to do over here is outside of the data, which is kind of this white space over here, I can do whatever I want. And whenever, whatever I do over here, um, when BIMLink imports that information, it will ignore everything in this space. 
and will only focus on what was basically between columns A and G. And so that allows me to use this kind of as my scratch pad over here. So what I'm gonna do over here is I'm gonna use a simple Excel formula. Um, and what I wanna do is our company policy is that all vetted families must be uppercase. So I'm gonna use an Excel formula called equals upper. And I'm gonna say it equals the uppercase of, and what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm gonna use a CSI division number. So division 23 in quotes, and which is concatenate, so it's gonna be division 23 air handler unit, and I'm gonna put my company uh, information in here, which is gonna be another underscore, and we'll call my company design.inc. How about that? Notice I made it kind of lowercase. It doesn't matter because when I get done and hit enter, it'll make it all uppercase. So there it is, division 23 air handler unit two design inc. Then I fill this down, and you see what it does right here. I copy this to the clipboard, and now I can paste this information right here. And just like that, all the families will be renamed. Let's go ahead and hit save, and I'll close this out. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to import this information back into my model. And actually, before I do that, let me just show you something, because it's always fun to see it kind of live. If I expand my families over here and go to mechanical equipment, here's what you saw in BIMLink. It's not poorly named, it just doesn't have any sort of organization, it doesn't look that great. So now let me come back to BIMLink and import this information and show you what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna let Revit chomp on this here for a moment. All right, as Revit uh, thinks about this, so we're just waiting on Revit here. And it should be done here momentarily. Okay. So right here, we get a lot of great feedback. Everything in yellow is what's changed and no errors and warnings. And we also report what the current value is and what it's about to be. All right, keep an eye out over here as I hit the import button. And just like that, all these families have been renamed. But as I mentioned before, when I click on them, I also wanna point out to you that the type mark has been taken care of and also the manufacturer information as well. And then here's that reminder to edit the model information. So just like that, BIMLink was able to help me rename and also fill in some information. So as I mentioned before, one of the things you wanna do in BIMLink, if you're new to it, is come over here and take a look at just some of the links that we've put together here. They'll help you uh, uh, really understand the, the power and capability of what BIMLink is able to do. Now I'm gonna show you one more quick example over here. Uh, I'm gonna bring up uh, an Excel file. So let me just go ahead and just show you uh, one of my Excel files over here. And it happens to be this quantity takeoff uh, over here. This is a sample file that we ship with uh, BIMLink. And this one here um, is basically takes the uh, full model data uh, of your Revit models, and it takes this information and then it summarizes it in a pivot table. This pivot table is designed to read the information from this tab. And so what I always like to tell people is BIMLink is not just about data editing and pull, you know, taking data in and out. It's also about just taking data out and summarizing it how you want to do it. So if you're into pivot tables or you like to write your own macros and you just need a way to take data out of the Revit model, consider BIMLink for that. So let me show you an example here where I'm going to replace all the information in here uh, so that the summary over here doesn't say ceilings and doors and et cetera, but maybe it's based on some mechanical equipment. So let's take a look at that process real quickly. I'm gonna come back to BIMLink over here and I'm gonna bring up uh, the QTO. So I'm gonna type in QTO over here and it's an instance-based link, meaning we wanna look at each instance of every element. All right, so it's gonna take a moment here because there's a lot of elements and you see over here there's 18,000 plus elements. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna uncheck all of the categories. I'm not interested in exporting out all the categories. But maybe what I want to do is export out like my mechanical equipment uh, and maybe some of my duct work. So I'll just do some duct accessories and duct fittings um, and maybe this much. All right. So only 5,394 elements. The goal here is to keep it pretty fast for this presentation. All right. So this is the basic information. I'm going to hit done now. OK. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to export this information out. And what I'm gonna do is when I click on this, you may think, oh, wow, you're gonna be uh, replacing that Excel file. And the answer is no, actually we're smarter than that. 
when I go there, it says I found a worksheet tab inside of that Excel file called QTO. I want to replace it. And you say that's amazing because it's going to uh, keep the uh, it's going to keep the pivot table intact. So this is going to take just a moment because we got to export a lot of information here. But you see here, it's going pretty fast. So it's processing 5,394 elements and it's going to write all the data out. So this will take just a moment. But now it's just writing out all the rows of data. And then watch this when I open the file. When I open the file, now it says duct accessories, duct fittings. And here's the basic information that we provided. And down here for the QTO, it brought in the new information for the duct and it actually overwrote this tab over here, but this stayed um, as is. We didn't overwrite the entire file. So here's an example of me not taking data out to edit. It's just taking data out of the Revit model so that I can do something else with it. Okay, so that's a little bit on uh, BIMLink. And Richard, I'll check in with you just a moment uh, for some questions here, but I figured I'll do one more uh, presentation on um, ID Explorer, and then we'll take some questions here. So ID Explorer. Uh, ID Explorer allows you to audit your BIM models with certainty. So what I like to say about ID Explorer is that this product is a true model browser. This is a product that I personally cannot live without. If you need to find anything and everything in your models, that's what this product is designed to do. If you try to find information in the project browser, it's really, really tough because it doesn't list everything. Another great feature of ID Explorer is this product called Query. So it's built in uh, right here and allows me to take my selection of elements and refine them down based on a large selection of parameters. Uh, and then I could distill that selection down as well. In addition to that, it has a whole warnings manager as well. So if you ever try to manage Revit warnings the old way, consider using ID Explorer where we can actually rank our warnings and isolate elements by their warnings and easily address our warnings as well. And so without further ado, I'm just going to get right into the ID Explorer demo because there's so much great stuff to show you guys. So I'm going to come back over here uh, to the Revit model. And uh, what I'll just go ahead and do is I'm going to switch over to a different uh, model over here. Here's a, a, a smaller model here with a lot of uh, issues, shall we say. And so ID Explorer over here, uh, once I launch it, it'll pop up uh, in this part of the screen. And what I'll go ahead and do is I'll just move it over here. Maybe it's because I'm a lefty. I'm not quite exactly sure why I always like to move it on this side. But by default, when you launch ID Explorer, it will um, uh, organize everything categorically in the active view. So what we're basically showing you here uh, is the active view and the element counts uh, uh, within this active view. And you can see over here, we break it down by category and then showing you the totals for the view. If I come over here and say entire project, then we get a element count for the entire project. And then you can see we're showing you a lot more information as well. So on a really simple level, um, you know, ID Explorer is a great way just to, to get to things. So for example, maybe I want to take some doors here uh, and you know, say, okay, I have a, this barn door double panel. There's two instances in this project. Here they are. I could select one. And if I want, I can even double click it. And when you double click, it will take you to a view uh, where that element exists so you can zoom in on it. OK, so, you know, there's a simple example. So even if you just want to use Explorer for this, absolutely. Uh, you know, if I select all my doors, you know, all 59 of them, you know, when I look at Revit, it stops right here just at the category It only shows you 59 doors. But the problem is I can't get any further information about these 59 doors. Where if I expand over here, you can see I'm getting all sorts of information down to the individual instances. So one of the things that I like to do with Explore is um, sometimes look at things and say, you know what, I need to do some type swapping. So maybe what I'll do is I'll pick, um, I don't know, I'll pick curtain panels or curtain, uh, yeah, let's do curtain panels. So in this case, I have 786 of them. Here are the different types. And then of course we have the system panels. And maybe at some point in time, we had to do some value engineering. Uh, and we're probably saying, you know what, uh, we need to change out these um, insulated panels over here, these 25 of them for, say, the infill panel. And so what I could do is I could just simply select these elements over here and swap them out for the infill panel. And just like that, when I now expand the system panels, there are now 36 infill panels uh, as opposed to less. So here are the ones that I was able to swap out. Really great you know, example and easy one to say, okay, I'm doing these audits here and saying, I need to do some swap outs, right? Because Revit doesn't show you this kind of list we do, 
okay? All right, now if you're like me, I make mistakes all the time. Um, and one of the mistakes that I make, and this is just a classic Revit problem, I think. Uh, for those of you that came from an AutoCAD background, you, you remember layers. Layers had colors. I think if we really knew our layer standards very well, we knew that if something was on the incorrect layer, we probably figured it out because of the color of the element on screen. Makes it a little bit more challenging with Revit when most things are just black and white. Um, and that mistake that I always make is putting things on the incorrect work set. Uh, the work sets, you know, is way down here, um, and it's just not as visible and in your face as I'd like it to be. So I can go along and realize, oh my gosh, I put a bunch of things on the incorrect work set. Well, one of the things I want to point out to you is um, everything by default sorted by category, but if I look over here, I can sort things in other ways. For example, I can look at things by level and say, what is on each level? And again, I can get element counts and categories for each level, which is nifty. You know, sometimes we, we could maybe realize, oh my gosh, some of these things should not be on this level. So we can select them, look at them further and make a decision from there. But my favorite one is work set. And when I look at work sets, we're showing you the project standard work set and a view work set, which those are the ones that Revit kind of creates. But then there's also our user created work sets. And those are the ones that you create as a company, right? And so here I see plumbing fixture, shared levels and grids, and so forth. Well, let's take a look. And if, you're, if you've done this before, I've actually created 3D and 2D views in which I've isolated um, uh, each of the work sets so that I can visually look at the elements that are on each work set. Uh, it's really a manual process. It's very error prone. I don't have a lot of confidence in it. Well, now I can look at all the elements from a data perspective. So for example, if I bring up plumbing fixtures, I can clearly see I have casework, furniture, uh, and walls on the incorrect work set. And what's nice about that, again, is I can come in here real quickly and say, well, let's take a look. Let's just make sure this isn't a plumbing fixture. Nope, it's a cabinet filler. Uh, and I can say, you know what? None of these should be on this plumbing fixture work set. I can now come over here and move them to work set one. And just like that, those elements are on work set one. Okay, and you can see they're now highlighted over here. Well, same thing over here. Let's look at work set one. Aha, I have 35 plumbing fixtures on the incorrect work set. Let's take a look at those. And like I did before, I could say none of these should be in this work set. They should be part of the plumbing fixtures work set. So I can select these things like so. And just like what I did before, I could, you know, take a look at them. I can double click them. Also, I should mention you can isolate the elements if you want to, right? So if you wanna take a look at it from this standpoint, you can do that, right? So we have all the power to just you know, how, use Revit to do whatever we need to do. So in this case, if I come back to the plumbing fixtures, let me just go back over here. Let me grab a couple of these uh, and switch them over to the plumbing fixtures work set. And just like that, they are now gonna be part of the plumbing fixtures work set. Now you may say, Sash, you know what? Uh, you should have just selected all the plumbing fixtures and moved them over. And the answer is yes, I should have, but I wanted to show you why that doesn't always work. I'm gonna select all the plumbing fixtures and you may notice that the work set is grayed out. Now we have to figure out why. Now, one, one of the things I don't wanna do is come over here and start selecting each one of these until I figure out which one uh, it grays out on. Instead, I'm gonna use a very powerful feature within ID Explorer called ID8 Query. And as I mentioned before, ID8 Query allows me to take a selection of elements and further refine them down based on parameters. And when I say parameters, do I mean parameters? Take a look at this uh, list of parameters. Parameters that you've never seen actually in Revit because Revit doesn't expose this stuff. But what this allows me to do is really distill this selection down based on, um, uh, on parameters uh, that may help me make a decision, like are these elements pinned? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so we can really take that selection and get more information about it. Now in this case, I'm interested in looking at the instances. First off, are they pinned? Let's select all 32 and all 32 of them are not pinned. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, who uh, last updated all of these elements? Meaning who can I blame maybe for all of this? And I can hold uh, control select and actually select last updated by, and it happens to be me, only me. I'm the one to blame for all of this because I'm the one that last updated all of these elements. So they're not pinned and they're not, uh, up, and they've all been updated by Sash. 
And then finally, because knowing what I know, I wonder if some of these families are nested. And so is nested is not a parameter you see in Revit, but it's one we built into Explorer and also into Bimlink. And if I hold down the control key, watch what happens. Now I see that none of them are pinned. They were all updated by Sash, but 31 of the 32 are actually not pinned, or I'm sorry, not uh, nested. So what I wanna do is take the ones that are not nested and watch what happens over here once I select just the 31 out of 32. So just like that, these are the non-nested families and now workset one's available and now I can move those over to the plumbing fixtures work set. And then finally, what I should probably do here is if I come back to entire project and go to work set one and look at the last remaining plumbing fixture, it happens to be the sink. And for those of you that are familiar with the architectural side of things, this is a built-in family that has the sink loaded into the uh, casework and then that's loaded into the Revit model. So in a situation like this, uh, I'm inclined to fix that family so I don't have this problem once again. So query is an incredibly powerful feature within uh, ID Explorer. I absolutely love it. It is my way of taking a large selection and distilling it down uh, to just the necessities. The other thing I want to point out about um, ID Explorer is, um, let me just go back to category. Um, I, if you're uh, auditing your Revit models like we do, you want to audit them on a weekly basis. And that says, you know, use the ID audit filter. And what the ID audit filter does is it allows us to distill our, um, uh, our uh, categories down to uh, elements where you need to be auditing on a work uh, weekly basis. <clears throat> so, for example, look for CAD imports, right? Look for huge usages of groups because groups can really constrain the model and cause the model to have performance issues. Lots of lines, you know, why are there so many lines and what are these lines, right? So I could take all these lines over here and easily swap them out for a different style, right? No problem. So I can come over here and move them over to whatever line style I want to. So again, we're just using Revit uh, features for this. But one of the things I wanna point out to you is I'm just gonna take a look at a couple of these here real quick. Uh, CAD imports. Uh, you can see over here there's 181 CAD imports. And if I look at one of these over here, um, you know, there's eight instances of the same CAD import. And the problem with this particular one over here is that, you know, maybe a mechanical engineer is still using AutoCAD and they're exporting out these DWGs and you're importing them instead of linking them. And now you've brought them in eight times. But what if I came in over here and, you know, say move this uh, over to here, just as an example. Um, and I'm going to just delete that dimension. But you can see over there, um, it does what it needs to do. But what's really bad about that, if I move it in one, did it move it in all, right? And so if I come over to another view, let me just select over here and just double click so we could take you to that view, take a look what happens over here. It did not move in that view, right? Just one of the compelling reasons not to use CAD imports. So in a situation like this, I may be inclined to remove those CAD imports and if need be, link them into the Revit model. All right, and the other one I'll take a quick look at and then we'll move on uh, to warnings and then uh, take questions here uh, is groups. And what we're looking for with groups are, you know, poor naming uh, and then also just inappropriate use of groups. So in this example over here, we're looking at a metal stud bottom track. That's not appropriate because somebody drew lines and then grouped it, didn't give it appropriate group name. And they should have used a detail component for that. So again, a great reason to use um, uh, you know, groups, uh, or in this case, not use groups, uh, but it's a great uh, tool for us to audit with as well. Um, okay, so let me just uh, go ahead and I'm just gonna go back to my 3D view that I like. I believe it's this one, yep. Uh, and so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you the last thing over here, and that happens to be warnings. Uh, warnings are evil, uh, and you should really manage your warnings on a, a weekly basis. And the reason why is if you do not manage your Revit warnings, uh, they will come back and haunt you, uh, whether it makes it difficult to upgrade your models to the next version of Revit or you become so overwhelmed by them, you can't address them. It is very important to do so. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all the details, but you can actually pre-rank your warnings and set them by severity. Um, and uh, and we ship uh, Explorer with a warnings ranking file uh, so that you can customize them as a company and distribute that uh, distribute that to the entire staff so that when they launch their Revit projects, their uh, warnings are already ranked. Um, we, by default, rank something like 55 or 60 warnings. There are over 900 warnings in Revit. Um, and so 
uh, it's that's a lot of warnings. We don't rank all of those. We give you the opportunity to do that. So all that information can be found under uh, this gear over here. Um, and again, we have more information on our website or feel free to reach out to us if you have questions. But really what I want to just show you real quickly is how cool this is. I could just easily select elements that are affected by warnings. Uh, or what I can also do here is like say here they are. I can come down here and isolate those elements and take a look at those, you know, from that standpoint. Or another really popular one that uh, we like to demo here is use this uh, section box over here and say, let me get a little more context over here and do a section box around it. So again, we're just using mostly built-in Revit functionality beyond that, uh, but that's a great way to select the elements. Uh, and at that point, what you could do is you could then say, okay, which ones are affected, you know, and tell me more about each one of these. Um, you know, uh, elements and who created and last updated uh, those elements. So we have a lot of great information over here to um, help you out. Um, so just, you know, this is a nice way to select those elements and, and, and make a decision. And like over here, I can isolate those elements. And then over here, I can start editing the sketches over here and fixing the problems until these warnings go away. So again, trying to do that uh, built in with built in Revit is nearly impossible. But there's one nice one over here, these identical instances in the same place. Uh, and what this is, is we're listing the elements that are that have duplicates, essentially. And this will cause all sorts of scheduling issues uh, and whatnot, right? And again, I can come over here and select these elements and do the selection box around it so that I can take a quick look. You can also double click if you need to and zoom in or zoom out um, on those elements as you see fit. But one of the things I want to point out to you, we actually have a built-in functionality over here. And let me show this to you. You may notice over here when I select these, they have element ID numbers. And you can see the second one on the list has a much higher element ID number. And what that basically means is this one came before this one. This one came before this and so forth. And what you can actually do with this identical instances is you can right click and say, I want to keep the originals and get rid of the newer ones, or I want to keep the newer ones and get rid of the older ones. When I hit retain originals, what we're basically doing is we're selecting all the newer elements and preparing you to delete them. Now, if you are worried about deleting those and want to know, are there dependencies? Like what are the implications if I delete those elements? Then here's what you can do. You may notice I have 110 elements selected over here. I'm going to close this and they still remain selected. I can come over to ID8 software and go to um, Smart Delete. And what Smart Delete is going to do under the ID8 apps is it's going to list every element and whether there are dependencies on those elements. And you can see everything in bold says, yes, there are dependencies. If I get rid of this dining room with chairs, there are four nested or five nested chairs in here, excuse me, four um, that will be deleted. OK, that's OK. And if I get rid of any of these round tables, there's just a furniture tag that's gonna go away. Okay, you know what? I'm okay with that. They're just tags. I can always re-tag. These ones here, I could do a little further investigation, but knowing what I know about this family, um, we're just gonna end up removing uh, the nested chairs. But everything else totally seems safe, so I'll go ahead and delete those 55. Um, and when I do that, look at this. They're all gone, and those high-ranked warnings, the red ones are no longer there and I'm no longer getting a warning about high ranked um, elements. So now I can move on to, let's say, the medium ranked warnings and address these next. So uh, again, a lot of power of Explorer, product that I cannot live without. I just, this is how I find my way around my model. Um, and so that's a little bit about that. Uh, so before I move on to the PowerPoint, Richard, do we have any questions or uh, comments or thoughts or feelings? Well, I think there's uh, mostly just a sort of a generic comment, <clears throat> which was about work sharing and, yeah. you know, the fact of like when you were doing Vimlink, uh, when you did a, when you do a sync with Central, those links are now available to other people within the project. You can also export them out as a very small link definition file, mm -hmm. and then you can re-import them into another project as well. Or you could have them be as your templates, uh, or within the templates, you could store the the bink the bink <laughs> the bimlink yeah. definition files, uh, and so that uh, once you create a new project, those link definitions would be there. So, and then in just sort of generically, we do a lot of work with work sharing, just making sure that all of our products uh, work within the laws of Revit, uh, and that you have the proper access, or that it's giving you the proper warnings if something's not able to be changed because of work sharing. 
Absolutely, yeah. We've had to build uh, build a lot of fail safe methods in there, so we do handle work sharing. And and uh, you know, Bimlink will warn you that it, you know it's being locked out by work sharing. So you know, if you're making big moves in Bimlink, like big data editing tasks, you know, send a message to everybody. Say, hey, you know, sync with Central, relinquish everything. I'm going to make some changes here, and then when I'm done, uh, I'll let you know. Because you don't want to have a whole bunch of uh, errors upon import saying it's locked, you know, uh, by work sharing. Um, but again, we handle all that really well, and Bimlink will warn you about all of that, which is really nice. And same with Explorer. Obviously, if you try to make changes and something's checked out, you'll just get the generic Revit warning that it's not editable because it's you know it's checked out by somebody else. Um, so we respect all those uh, those warnings and errors. Awesome, thank you. Appreciate it, Richard. No problem. Okay, let's talk about ID Style Manager, our newest product. Uh, so ID Style Manager allows you to take styles like object styles, line styles, fill patterns, etc., analyze them for usage, and then make a decision on whether or not you want to keep them uh, or delete them. Uh, trying to do this in Revit is a near impossible task because Revit doesn't have any uh, any ways of handling this. So here's an example of uh, taking the object style subcategories, doing an analysis on each subcategory and then telling you where it's being used and how many instances there are of each one. Then from there, you can make a decision. Do you want to do the merge and purge? Meaning, I don't want to use this uh, clearance under uh, plumbing fixtures. It really needs to become part of ADA clearance. So I can take those styles and merge them, and then these 12 that belong to here will become part of the ADA clearance. And then for those that have no usage whatsoever, because Revit doesn't report this info to you, I have the option to keep them, or I can simply delete them. Uh, so again, a great way to manage this. So these are the current kind of categories that we analyze. Um, and so what I've done here is I put together a quick video. Uh, and the reason why I did a video here is because, um, you know, if uh, uh, some of this analysis can take a little bit of time because we're literally turning over every stone uh, when we do an analysis. And so I kind of sped up some of the analysis process uh, in the video. So I'll walk you through this uh, for the next few minutes here. So again, ID Style Manager can be found under the ID8 Software tab. Uh, like Bimlink, uh, we get a welcome to ID8 Style Manager with a quick start guide. Uh, so be sure to check that out if you're new to the product. Uh, up over here, you can see that these are all the categories that we currently, hint, hint, currently analyze. If I go to Object Styles, uh, by default, we are showing you everything, things that have not been analyzed, things that are used or unused, uh, and including imported styles, so like CAD imports as an example. Let's look at those CAD imports by going to the Object Styles dialog box. And when we go to there and I expand this two-door cabinet.dwg, this is what we're talking about. We have the main DWG file and then kind of all the layers down below. And in the Revit dialog box, it doesn't tell you if they're being used. So deleting them could be very, very risky. I certainly don't like those styles. So I'll double click here um, to do an analysis. You could simply double click and we're gonna report back that the there are two uses, one is an arc tick and one's another one as well. You can also bulk select and do an analysis. And this is the part that I sped up a little bit. And you can see we're reporting some ones and zeros, maybe a two. And I can also filter this list and say, okay, show me things that have only been analyzed. And then you know, show me things that uh, are uh, only unused. And so you can say, do I wanna keep these or do I wanna delete them? In this case, I wanna delete them. So just like that, we remove those styles safely uh, because Revit doesn't tell you if they were being used. Now we have some ones that are being used, okay? And then you can see over here that those are also um, uh, matching the dialog box. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in over here and I'm gonna merge those two. And what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna merge those two into the main DWG setting. And when I do that, now what happens is those two styles are still in use, but now they're part of the two-door cabinet.dwg. And when I look over here, you can see that that has been cleaned up significantly uh, just like that, okay? Now, I'm gonna go to not analyzed, all right? So we're gonna basically bring the list back with the exception of showing you any more imports. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna scroll down to plumbing fixtures. And when I look at the plumbing fixtures over here, you can see that uh, those are all the categories and subcategories over there. And you can see I have 12 uses of this subcategory called clearance. Some belong to groups, some belong to families and so forth. What I wanna do is I wanna merge that into the ADA clearance, because that's our office standard, even though there are no uses of it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the best attempt to merge that into uh, that style. Now, 
for uh, things like groups, we have no programmatic access to groups, meaning we cannot actually change it programmatically because Revit won't allow us to, but we tell you why we can't merge it. So from that 12, we're down to nine, you'll have to go into those groups and manually take care of that. So we give you good warnings uh, and information um, if, a, if an operation cannot be completed. Now you notice over here, as I click on each one of those, you see some color coding for like line styles and line patterns and fill patterns. And without even analysis, we were able to identify duplicate elements. And what we're saying over here is based on the style, line weight of one, a black color, solid line pattern. You can see that just in the salmon color, there's a ton of lines that are literally the same, they're just named differently. And if I do an analysis here, this will take just a moment, but basically if I do an analysis over here, you can see there are many uses of these line styles, right? So for example, 148 of zero, right? And we can see 4,669 thin lines, right? So we can see there's a lot of uses of uh, the same line styles and it's kind of unfortunate, but now we can clean this up and maybe I want to take this A anno text and merge it with thin lines. And what will happen here is now all those lines will become part of thin lines. So a nice way to just say, I want to take all these and merge them into one or two styles. And again, as I mentioned before, for line patterns and, and build patterns, same process. You can isolate duplicates and, and have a look at those if you want to. You don't have to isolate them. It's really up to you. Now for materials and material assets, any sort of merging that you do here, uh, the uh, whatever was assigned those materials, they will be assigned the new materials as well. And then for things like filters, again, if we do an analysis over here, we have some filters that are not being used, uh, including one that Richard created, right? And so I can come in over here and delete those, but maybe I don't wanna use this rule called uh, you know, interior walls. Maybe they're all supposed to be part of exterior walls. So whatever views we're using interior walls, they will now use the exterior walls and its settings that you had set up before. And then for view templates, what I wanna point about view templates is we don't even have to do an analysis to tell you there's a usage of it. And if you compare it to Revit, what I wanna point out over here is Revit kind of tells you a little bit of information in terms of usage. Um, you know, We tell you right next to it that it's being used, but if I come in over here, Revit only tells you that it's being used once, but it doesn't tell you where we actually tell you where it's being used. So again, if you do any uh, merging, uh, whatever views we're using that view template, they'll get reassigned to that new view template. And then finally with scope boxes, if you do any sort of merging of scope boxes, whatever views or levels or grids were assigned those scope boxes, they'll be reassigned to the new scope box that you merge it into. So again, ID Style Manager is a great product to help you clean up your Revit models um, and do an analysis to find out where they're being used. Revit is not capable of doing that. So uh, something to kind of keep in mind here when using a product like Style Manager, it's incredibly powerful. And then after Sticky, Richard will take some questions here again, but let's take a look at Sticky. So ID at Sticky allows you to live link your Excel files as schedules, or you could take Word, Excel, and PDFs and live link those as images into your Revit projects. And the nice thing about that is any changes to this information gets updated in your Revit model. There's no more simulated data entry. So if you're making fake key schedules to make a, a, a simulated you know, a table, you don't need to do that anymore. Do everything in Excel and live link that, whether it be your starting views, uh, your you know sheet indexes that are way too complicated for Revit, whatever it may be, you can use Sticky to help you with this task. It's also compatible with BIM 360 via the Autodesk desktop connector. So if you're doing projects on BIM 360, like most people are today, um, can, you can put your Excel files on BIM 360 and live link them directly from there, from there with desktop connector. Also want to point out BIMLink allows you to export and import your Excel files from BIM 360 as well. So again, Sticky is pretty cool for all of this. And let me just go ahead and give you a brief demo because it's such an easy product to, uh, to demonstrate here. So I'm going to just create a new sheet here. And I'll just go ahead and just create a one over here like so. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, launch Sticky. And uh, I'm going to remove some of these here. So give me one second here. And there they are. Okay, so here's your Excel as schedules or Word, PDF, and Excel as images. So uh, like you would do, like leaking a file, I'm going to go to create, and I'm going to go pick a source file. And what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and browse to my 
uh, webinars folder here. And I'm gonna pick this uh, Excel file that's the Philips one. And the Philips one's cool because it has some images and multiple tabs inside of it. And so when I link that, uh, it says, hey, pick a worksheet. And there, so there are multiple worksheet tabs in, uh, in this file. So I'll just pick the chloride. And then you could pick a worksheet region, whether it's a print area or a named region, or if you did some really cool formulas to generate regions, you can also pick from that. And I'll just leave it the name Sticky Phillips Chloride. And when I hit OK, you can see over here the uh, basic information about it. It's uh, work sharing status is current. It's editable, the whole bit. I'm sorry, work sharing status is editable. It's current, meaning it hasn't been updated or is out of date yet. You can also do absolute, relative, and BIM 360, which I'm not uh, currently logged into BIM 360 and didn't link it from BIM 360, but that would also be another option as well. Now, when I hit close, you can see that it shows up right here. And there you have it, right? It brought in the images and everything, but this is actually from an Excel file. Now, because I brought it in as a schedule, it's gonna show up right here. And if I go to it, you could see that it is looks very much the same as uh, you saw it on the sheet. And if I need to make any changes to this, I would go back to the source file to actually make changes. And I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do that for a different file type here. I'm not gonna do that for this example here. So I also wanna show you how cool Sticky is when it comes to doing like Word, PDF, uh, and Excel as images. So very similar here, uh, I'm gonna go to Create. And this time, let me just go back to that same folder over here. Let's see, here we go. And I'm gonna bring in the specifications file. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Open. All right, and when I bring this in, it's a, it's a little bit of a diff different interface. Here, I can pick what pages I want. So maybe I want one, two, uh, four, no, let's do three, if I could do this right, three, and then we'll do, uh, let's say five through seven. So that's pretty neat, right? I can pick what pages I want. I can also pick my DPI. Uh, and you could do a full preview if you want to of each one of these. And when I hit okay, it's gonna take a moment, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna do all the conversion of the word over to the images for you and live link them into your project. And again, I could take a look at all the information about each one and even get what sheet they're on. So that's pretty neat, right? And when I do that, we by default, in this case, we put them outside of the title block. So if I want to, I can kind of, you know, move these around however um, I see fit, right? So I can, you know, do something like that if I want to. And you can actually use the align tool uh, if you want to and, and get the the, uh, the borders of the images. So for example, if I go to align here, I can get, you know, that information, right? So that's pretty helpful um, as well. Okay. If I zoom in on it, the visual quality is spectacular, right? So again, you can pick what quality you want um, and, um, and, and get this great information out of here. Now, what I wanna point out to you is, um, you know, again, it brought in the watermark, the, uh, the exact quality and everything here is exactly what we're looking for. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to my specifications file. This is the actual file that I just linked in. And what makes uh, Sticky so compelling, especially as images is, you can bring in other types of, uh, of data that may only be in Word or Excel that maybe a sticky schedule can't do because a sticky schedule is rendered in the header of a, of, a, uh, of a Revit schedule. And therefore, if it's a special type of object, we won't be able to show it because Revit can't do that. But I can come in over here, for example, and say under insert, you know, maybe I wanna insert some smart art just as an example. And maybe I wanna insert one of these uh, things over here, right? And I could say A, you know, B, C, right? And one, two, three, you get the idea, right? And I can put that in here, you know, like so. I can also, um, you know, highlight this if I want to, and I can come over here and, and change the, the font color, right? I can do all that and I can change some of the font color where Revit doesn't actually allow you to do this with text. You can't change the font color of a sentence mid-sentence, it just doesn't allow you to do that. All right, so I'm gonna hit save here, and when I come back to the Revit model, and I come back to Sticky, you can see over here that it recognizes it's out of date. And so I can select all of these and hit update. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make the updates uh, right over here, and you're gonna see this in just a moment. And see, just like that, we're able to make those updates, which is really cool. So take a look at this over here. Red, there's that text color mid-sentence. There's your uh, smart art. And the reason why you don't see numbers here is because I didn't put those numbers in the Word file. Therefore, um, it's not going to show it, right? 
So that's pretty neat. We're able to to basically bring in any sort of object that we want to by using sticky. If it was done as a schedule, this information would not render because it's not possible to render this type of table in a header of a schedule. So if you run into that, this is where sticky um, becomes really compelling. So again, live link, uh, these, you know, sometimes we get questions about file size, you know, does it increase the file size significantly? We have uh, charts on our website that talk about that, but what we found out is it does not do that. Uh, Richard, before I get into our last demo, we'll be a few minutes over uh, time here. Uh, any questions so far or since uh, the last uh, questions before I get into the last uh, demo here? Well, you actually identified one of the questions that came in was about the size. <clears throat> so ah. I was I was actually going through and trying to find that on the, the website, and I'll put that link in the question panel. Uh, Fantastic. For that to help. Um, also, you alluded to it. <clears throat> Some people asked when you were doing ID8 Style Manager, about mm -hmm. the ability for text styles. And I know mm -hmm. I just, um, as you kind of uh, joked a little bit, we are looking at increasing our collection so that the answer to that is stay tuned, basically. Um, hopefully we'll have that ability um, fairly soon. Uh, yes, um, and that's then, a great question. Then another question about working with ID8, uh, or working with uh, Autodesk BIM 360. And basically we're working with BIM 360 via the Autodesk desktop connector. So instead of like the way that Sash browsed to his local directory, he would just browse to the project via the desktop connector um, yep. and be able, and so the desktop connector is what's keeping it in sync with the BIM 360 hub. So that was the question that came up as well. That's a great question, right. So uh, you'll have to be logged in to the desktop connector, but then once you are and you have access to your projects, then you can access those stickies and do your um, live linking or updates uh, if need be. And we have uh, information on our website on that whole process as well. Thanks, Richard, appreciate that. No problem. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just demo a couple uh, things here real quickly with ID8 apps, because I know we're um, at the uh, bottom of the hour. So if you hang on a few more minutes, uh, I'll just show you some stuff here. As you can see, there's a, a lot to demo. Um, so you saw a quick one, a smart delete, where I, um, I had uh, basically, uh, was not quite sure if I was ready to delete those elements. I wanna see if there was dependencies on any of those elements. And when I used smart delete, it said yes, some of these elements you're about to delete do have tags, but other than that, that's all they are. So I felt confident in making that decision. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, review renumber and a couple of the sheet uh, and view tools. So uh, I'm in a larger uh, architectural file over here. Um, and I'm just gonna renumber some rooms and doors real quickly just to show you the power of renumber. Uh, ID8 renumber uh, allows you to uh, renumber pretty much anything in your Revit model. Uh, based on criteria that you can define or rules that you can use that we have shipped with the product. Um, like BIMLink, we have access to a lot of parameters. So for those of you that want to, let's say, renumber your lighting based on a space name and a space number uh, and maybe want to increment you know, those uh, numbers, you can do that with a product like uh, renumber. Uh, so again, we can renumber pretty much anything. For those of you that need to renumber all your uh, views that are on your sheets and you You've always been doing that workaround where you put maybe a letter after each number so you can kind of reset the numbering and then go back and make it one, two, three, four. We actually do all of that for you in renumber. You just tell it where you want to start and we'll take care of the rest for you. So for this real easy example here, I'm going to show you renumbering uh, rooms. And you can see over here in my rooms, I drew with a detail line a series of, uh, of lines and they're all connected together. Okay, that all they are is just detail lines. And you can use any detail line you want, or you can use the default one that uh, renumber builds in. But what makes this so compelling is when I go to renumber, I could take the rooms rule and I can just type in what number uh, the level I'm on. I'm on level one. And then I want to start maybe at room 1000. And then I can pick individual elements, or I can draw a new path if I haven't drawn one already. And then if I've already drawn one, how do I want to renumber it? Do I want to renumber where a line goes through a room and if it even hits a corner of a room, it renumbers along that? Or do you want to renumber it along a vertice, meaning when a vertice hits a room, it'll renumber along that. So in this case, this is what I'm interested in doing. So I'm going to take this and hit start numbering. And down here it says select a line. All I need to do is select the, the first line of the chain. We do the rest of the calculations for you. And when I hit accept changes, 
just like that, all of these rooms have been renumbered. So if you wanna do that with spaces, lighting fixtures, curtain wall panels, whatever it may be, we have you covered, right? So really easy to use renumber. And we can customize these rules if you have a parameter that's set on a level. Let's say you have a custom parameter for a level and you wanna renumber your rooms based on that parameter, you can build that into the rule and it will use that parameter and the data in that parameter. So you don't have to just rely on the rules that we've made, you can completely and fully customize these rules uh, right over here by picking the fields that you wanna put in here and some constants and some incrementers as well. It's incredibly powerful. We have more information on our website about that. Uh, okay, now let's do doors. Uh, and what's nice about doors is I can pick a starting increment. Uh, and I'll just show you real quickly here. When I go to the doors rule, uh, this increment over here, uh, we could start here and it'll increment um, by one, meaning A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and so forth. And every time it hits a new room, it restarts the uh, numbering or the lettering in this case, A, B, C. And then when it gets to the new uh, room, it'll be A, B, C. Uh, for uh, rooms that have only one door that goes into it, we're gonna say leave singles blank, meaning don't put a letter A after it, just use the same, uh, make the door number match the room number. If you uncheck that, then you'll get the letter A after each one of the doors um, that swing into um, uh, a room. So we can totally customize this if you want to, that's the power of this product. So in this case, I wanna make all my doors have the letter A with the exception of single ones. And what's great about this is I can use the auto number by view without having to draw a path through it because we'll recognize where it where the to and from room is and we'll get you covered in that regard. And so just like that, when I scroll down, you can see here, it's recognizing the old door numbers and new ones. And when I hit accept changes, now you can see over here how wonderful this is and how easy it can actually renumber um, all of my doors by using the room number. So again, we have some information on our website and we have other videos that show you this process, but I just wanna show you how fast and powerful this is. And again, if I add another door in here, another two doors, I can go back to renumber real quickly and just bring up that rule and hit one button and boom, it'll just go ahead and take care of all the numbering for me. Unfortunately, these rooms don't have any uh, doors, which is kind of weird, um, but that's okay. We have doors over here and you can see that they're all matching uh, perfectly. So again, lighting fixtures, curtain wall panels, room spaces, uh, renumber can handle it. Okay, and then finally, what I wanted to show you here um, uh, is just a couple of uh, uh, products over here. Uh, I wanna show you some view creator and sheet manager because if you have very large projects, uh, creating views uh, that match uh, in terms of scope box, uh, in terms of view template assignments, view use categories, uh, et cetera, uh, can be quite the task. So here's an example of a floor plan view with dependents. Uh, and in this floor plan view, it's using you know, a view template over here. It's got a face setting and a face filter. It's got all these settings in here. For me to match all of this with the naming conventions and everything uh, for a multi-story project, it could take a very long time uh, to complete. So you could consider using View Creator for this. And what's great about View Creator is we have the ability to create new plans based on levels, which is what I'm gonna show you. You can duplicate views, uh, which means I could say, I wanna take all these and duplicate them um, as uh, let's say uh, working views, or I wanna duplicate them to a new phase. Um, that's awesome. I can do all of that with View Creator. So once I get one thing set up, I can totally uh, duplicate and, and copy them from there. Or I could say, hey, I have this floor plan with dependents. I wanna apply those to other views. So I'm gonna take this uh, plans to level and I'm gonna use one of our built-in rules here that's for level. And what that says is, you know, if your floor plan names and your level names are somewhat similar, we can actually use that rule and predict how these views should be named. So for example, if I come over to this building section here real quickly, let me just, uh, I hit edit profile there. Uh, let me just do this. If I come over here, this says level one and it has level one in the name. So there should be some predictability in terms of how these views are uh, created. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come over to ID8 software and go to view creator. And then I'm gonna say plans of levels and use our rule. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this one here, I'm gonna grab this level one floor plan, which is this, and I'm gonna grab the level one RCP while we're at it. So I have two completely different view types, but because of the way they're named and they're associated to levels, view creators should be able to um, uh, figure out the naming convention. And for now, I'm not gonna copy the duplicate views. 
And then I'm gonna copy these up to a few different levels. And what we're gonna do here now is we're going to build a list of the views that will be created. So you're gonna to wanna to see this, this is pretty exciting stuff. I appreciate everybody hanging out a little extra here. There's just so much great stuff to show, we wanna we want to show it to you. Okay, so here's what it looks like. We're gonna level two floor plan, level three, four, five, and also RCPs, the naming convention looks good. And if you wanted to, if there was something you didn't like in terms of the naming convention, you could do a find and replace. And you can also add like a, uh, uh, a um, let's say a prefix or a suffix to the end. So maybe if these are working views or whatever they are, you could absolutely do that if you want to. Uh, I'm gonna remove, um, I'm gonna uh, find the dash SMK over here uh, and replace it with nothing. So you can see over there how easy it is to do that. I'll go ahead and create the eight views and take a look over here now in your project browser. Watch what happens over here. Got to give us a moment here as the views are being created by Revit. And just like that, we created the level two floor plan and it is actually based on level two. So take a look over here. We can see it's based on level two. It has the same view template assignment, uh, phase, and all that information. Now what I could do if I wanted to, because I said no to this, if I want to uh, apply dependence, I can use our dependent rule over here and say I want to grab these three dependents and I want to apply them to two, three, four, and five. And look what happens when I apply them to level one. I'll show you how smart View Creator is. View Creator says, hey, uh, this is already in use. You can see that right there. So what I could do is I could take these three right here and remove them from the list. But if I look at the naming conventions over here, level two, level three, level four, level five, that's exactly how I want these to look. And I can go ahead and create those dependent views. And just like that, I now have dependent views and they all match exactly how I want them to be. So this is uh, you know, very compelling, right? So I can create hundreds of views named a certain way, um, whether they're working views, sheet views, whatever it may be, I can do all of that in a really quick order uh, and, and build up my model. Once I'm done, I'm done. And then if I gotta come back to View Creator later to maybe make new views for CA work, sketch sheets, whatever it may be, I can do that. And then finally, let me just show you some sheet manager here. Uh, if you ever struggle with placing views on sheets and, and that whole bit, you know, consider using a sheet manager. Uh, and what's great about sheet manager is, you know, I can come in over here and I can drag these views uh, onto my sheets. And I'll just show you something here real quickly. When I drag this view onto a sheet, um, it takes a moment, we gotta wait for Revit to, to do this. When I double click on here, you could see that we kind of centered it uh, in the title block. And I'm gonna actually remove this real quickly because what's great about this here is we're looking at the edge of the title block and centering the view between that by default. You can actually change the setting uh, for where these, um, you know, where these uh, views are placed based on left, right, top, or bottom of the title block. So for example, on the sheet, maybe I want everything to be 3.25 inches inbound from the right hand side. And so now when I come back over here and drag this view onto the sheet, you should see that it's gonna be a little bit moved over. You see that right there? So that's a nice way. Sometimes people are, are happy with the, the placement of the views on sheets and leave them where they're at. So you can actually really customize um, you know, how these are, are placed. So what I'm doing here is I'm placing you know, these level twos on the 102, Q1, Q2, Q3 uh, floor plans, okay? Now, I don't have uh, any sheets for level threes, quadrant one through three. You can see now after that, I just go to exterior elevations. So since I want each one of these views to be on their own sheet, what I could do here is I can actually create sheets from views. And what's neat about this is I could say, okay, this is really great. Uh, I want to use a sheet as a template. All right, so maybe, you know, uh, maybe I use a blank sheet, okay? So maybe a blank sheet, and that way it centers it, you know, somewhere here on the sheet, okay? And then if I had other line work on there, if I had a legend and I drew some lines in there, we can actually copy that information onto those sheets as well. So we're trying to copy as much sheet base info as we can. And in this example, what I wanna do is I wanna start the next series at A-103-Q1. Okay, because you can see these are level three quadrant ones. So I wanna kind of keep in line with this numbering. And watch what happens here when I go to create the sheets. We're just about done here. Um, so I'll make this go fast. Okay, what we did here is we actually by default put the view category assignment 
um, uh, right here uh, in the name. So if you don't like that, no problem, because what I could do is I can edit the sheet names uh, like you saw me do earlier with the view names under View Creator. And what I could do here is I can manually double click in here if I wanted to and just delete those. Or what I could actually do is I can copy that and say find that uh, and with the space and replace it with nothing. And then I can select all those sheets and replace all. And now what it does, when I look at my sheet names, they look very much the same as what you see over here, A103Q1, Q2, Q3. And when I hit OK now, take a look at this. When I go to these sheets, when I double click on it, that's the, the floor plan that I'm looking for. So that's a really nice way to you know, get these views on sheets. Now notice over here, if I come over to quadrant three over here, sorry, this one over here, what I wanna point out to you is that this one's a little bit over here. And so now what I could do here is I can use my align tool and I can say, okay, on A10, uh, on A, let's see, here's what I actually want to do first. I'm going to open the, a couple sheets here real quickly. So let me just do this. Now, when I come over to align and I pick A101Q1, what I want to do is take this floor plan right here and I want to take the A102Q1 floor plan and the A103. Q1 floor plan and align those to match this one. And so when I hit align, those will match up. And then I could take the A101Q2 and I could say, okay, I want to take the A102Q2 and the A103Q2 and align those to match as well. And so what happens is those views will actually be aligned to each other. So let me just show you what that looks like and then we'll take questions and uh, close this out. But when I come over here to my A sheets, and I go to A101Q1, when I go to A102Q1, you can see that those are exactly in the same position. And then when I go to A101Q2 and A102Q2, those are aligned in the same position. And what I want to answer here is floor plans, ceiling plans, structural plans, area plans, those will actually align to the XY coordinates of the Revit model. And then things like elevations, sections, schedules, those will align in the upper left-hand corner of the bounding box. Richard, do we have any uh, uh, any questions that I could uh, answer here? Yeah, I think most of the other questions I tried to answer uh, as we went through. Um, you know, the there the great question about the uh, on ID8 uh, sticky of whether you should use schedules or whether you should use images and how much. Im um, how much yeah. do the images actually impact the size of the Revit model? I included that link uh, in the question chat uh, panel. So please review that on our website. And there's a nice chart that talks about the differences between images and the um, schedules and the different uh, size limitations. And you know, even uh, with, <clears throat> with searching text, you can search text on a, uh, on a, a schedule, but you can't search text within an image because it's an it's a pixel Correct. to raster image so there's always pluses and minuses um yep. that you have to uh, review before thinking about which one you'd like to use it's a great great point i'd say if it's really complicated and it's beyond just kind of basic text and lines and some images if you're putting smart art in there or some other types of graphics that cannot be rendered in a header of a revit schedule because of the limitations of revit then consider going to images where you're going to get literally a exact um think of it as kind of like when you hit print um and whatever prints out of the printer that's what you're going to get um so images have been huge uh you know to try to do uh word as uh, schedules is a near impossible task without way too much crazy formatting um i think as images has worked out really well so definitely give it um give it a a, a look um Okay, and we did get another good question uh, from Amy here that I want to look at. It says, in View Creator, can you create views from a linked model? Um, so right now, at this time, we don't, um, but we will log this as a feature request. It has been logged before, uh, and I think it's a great one. And so we'll, uh, so Amy will be sure to absolutely do that um, as well. So, Richard, anything exactly. else? Um, I think that's the the most of it, um, or the like I said, I think uh, I tried to answer all the questions either publicly or if it was very specific privately, but um, th that's great. Thank you, Sash. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for hanging out longer. Uh, it is always so much great stuff to show here. And, you know, uh, I do appreciate your time and I hope you found a lot of value in this. Thank you, Richard, for your help. 
uh, check out our website, id8software.com. If you want to link in with me, I always love to link in with people and, and keep in touch. So there's my information. There's my contact information as well. Uh, be sure to download a trial on our website um, as well at id8software.com. I'll put the slide back up here um, in case you want to reference it. So we'll hang out here for a minute. Uh, but again, thank you for your time. And um, let us know if you have any questions. We're here to help.